What's up, everybody? Tanner Larson here, and welcome back to the Optimized E-Commerce Podcast. Super excited to have you here and also be joined today by a repeat guest, Eric Kwaka from the BGS Revenue Optimization Team. Eric's one of our RO experts and works on all the Amplified stores. He also trains in our different programs, and more than likely, he'll be speaking on stage at our next event. And you know, just a big, big part. And he didn't actually know that until I just threw that at him right there. But uh, <laughs> Eric, Eric's uh, a big part of what we do at BGS. And he's, uh, he's got one of those brains that just is like a, it's just, it's amazing the way he can, he can figure out and, you know, test data and then turn that into an optimization and turn that into something that wins for the store and just picking it apart. He's done some amazing, amazing work for our clients. And today, He's not really here to talk to you about optimization. He's here to talk to you about a different topic, which is just as important, but it's something that I can say that I don't, I've never heard another e-com expert guru program or whatever talk about, but it is critically important. And that is web usability or web accessibility. Okay. And this is pertaining to people, you know, who may have a disability or something else and how they can, how they use the internet and how they need to be able to use your site as well as why that's important to you as the business owner from both a legality standpoint, as well as a, um, you know, just serving your customer standpoint. So Eric is probably the perfect guy to talk about this subject because he understands the nuances of it. Um, and he can actually break that what's some, somewhat of a complicated jargon down into uh, usable and actionable strategies for you guys. Now, don't roll your eyes. Don't turn this episode off because web accessibility is one of those things that is super, super important. Now, let me give you uh, a scare a scare real quick about how important that can be, okay? Specifically within the accessibility space, one of the um, things you have to be aware of is the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, okay? Now, the ADA is a legitimate organization. The problem is there are lots of shitty, shady, shyster type lawyers out there who will t take the ADA's mission and use the ADA to go out and put lawsuits on companies left and right, whether they're brick and mortar or internet based or whatever. And they'll get somebody who may be, you know, deaf or blind or whatever to be their, their plaintiff or whatever. And then they'll go out and they'll just target a hundred businesses and then roll them all up into this one lawsuit and to say how this one person that they hired basically was uh, impacted by the non ADA compliance of these, all these companies. Okay. And it's, it's legitimately, it's, it's legal scamming because it's legal to sue, but what they're doing is completely fraudulent the way that they're doing it, but they get away with it because they're playing within the, the legal realm of the world. And this happens a ton online. Uh, we, we've seen recently lots of uh, ADA cases popping up where um, a, a lawyer will wrap up 100, 200 different e-com stores or e-com properties into an ADA lawsuit, all affected by the exact same person. And then they, they basically go out and they say, hey, we'll either go to court or you can settle for this sum and pay us off. And uh, they, they, they look, it, it, it's shit, guys. I, I promise you it's complete dog shit, but it, it happens and it happens a lot. And typically you don't have much room to fight. You basically pay them whatever the settlement negotiated settlement is to avoid having it go to trial and have it go become a bigger problem that costs more money. And you basically pay them to go away. So there's ways around that by being aware of the Accessibility Act and not just ADA, but web accessibility protocols as they pertain to the entire internet. And Eric's gonna to touch on some of that stuff. So a little bit of a scare at the point, but that's just how important it is. And we know sites, we know stores that have been impacted by this. Um, and we actually, in our Amplified Partner Program and, and Ecom Insider and everything, we teach our members how to avoid this or at least put as much protection around themselves as they possibly can. Uh, so this will be a very good episode for you guys. So with that, Eric, now that they're scared, why don't you take over and why don't you, because uh, this is Eric's multiple times. He's been on here multiple times, so he knows the game and he's you know good at podcasts, but um, he'll he'll take the, the fear out of it a little bit, just show you some actionable stuff. But Eric, start with what is web, web accessibility? And let's just start from the beginning and work our way through it. Yeah, well, just uh, just to help alleviate some of the scare, like out of the gate, because it's like these rules are not meant to try to make it hard to start a business. A lot of these have kind of like lower thresholds on when they start to take effect. So if you're just planning your store, you're just getting started, 
don't think that this is some new thing that you have to run out and master before you can even get started. Like you can start your store, worry about this later in terms of the, you know, unscrupulous lawyers, they aren't going after companies that have no money in the first place. Like if you don't have sales, like a lot of these rules don't apply to you really in the first place. And they're not, they're not going to get anything from you. So there's no point in wasting their time. Mm -hmm. Um, So just, we'll get into some of these other things later, but if you're a small store, this is like, you know, your low five digits per month in revenue. Most of these rules don't really apply even throughout the EU and stuff. They have cutoffs. Like the ADA's big one is 15 employees. Is there like when it starts to kick in and some similar EU laws are like only at 2 million revenue, but obviously this is not legal advice. You need to, if you're getting up there, you know, you should be looking into this, but we'll talk about that a bit later, but let's get into, you know, as you said, what is web accessibility? Uh, well, well, let's take this story back to the start of the internet, the start of the web. Uh, so it was invented by this Tim Berners-Lee, and he had this amazing vision when he built the World Wide Web that it would be, you know, just truly just something for everybody, information accessible by everybody. So he's specifically like quoted as saying, like, the power of the web is in its universality. Access by everyone, regardless of disability, is an essential aspect of that. And it can be really easy in all of this, um, you know, especially the scares and like a lot of the check boxes and what can seem very difficult, uh, thinking about it as just like meeting these standards so that you don't get sued. Uh, but it's still all about serving people and making sure that, uh, you know, everybody can access all of this amazing content on the internet evenly, equally, um, you know, you're not making sure that keyboard navigation works on your site just so that lawyers don't send you letters. You're doing it so that people that can't use a mouse can still access, you know, your products. And uh, it does go a bit further than that even too, because a lot of these things can be very critical for those with significant uh, disabilities, but you'll find that a lot of them actually do benefit others that may not be in that realm of what you consider disabled. Uh, Sometimes it could just be people with temporary injuries. You know, if you've broken your collarbone, you can't use your mouse, suddenly keyboard navigation is important to you until you get better. Uh, So it's benefiting you there or even situational disabilities where just the way that you're interacting with the web at that time is causing some issues that may not be generally a problem for you. So you can kind of think of web accessibility as like an electronic curb cut. You know, like curb cuts were a big uh, thing that took a long time to get implemented in cities. This is where the curb like goes down to the street, um, you know, flush with the street, primarily so that people in wheelchairs can have some autonomy to move around pedestrian spaces similar to those that can walk. Uh, But once they put those in, you know, other people found benefits from it. Like if you're moving packages with a trolley, you know, it's easier to just take it up the curb cut than over the curb or someone pushing a child in a stroller or people riding bikes and skateboards. Like maybe these people can get through a curb with a little bit of effort, but even just having the little curb cut benefits everybody. So it was like essential to some people, but then very helpful to many others. Um, So to bring it to the digital example of that, like you get, we always, kind of talk about, it's like, you need to have your text be at least 16 pixels, like the minimum, that should be your smallest text is 16 pixels and very high contrast, especially when it's small. And that can be really important for older users and those with vision issues, but it can also be very beneficial to people that may have perfect vision, but they're in a situation where there's a lot of glare on their screen. If their text is low contrast, they're just not gonna be able to see it, but if it's high contrast, they can still see it through the glare. So they're not disabled, but they still like have a situation in which this is benefiting them. So this does kind of all pull together in some other optimization ways, but there are some ways in which it's focused on more for this specific demographic. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that was, that was good. I like the analogies. It actually kind of helped. I even have a more clear idea of it now because I've never thought about it in uh, like that, in that sense makes a lot of, makes a lot more sense thinking about it. Like, like the curb cuts, like, yeah, now everybody can access it. I, I would ma- rather do that than step up on the curb, especially if I'm riding my bike. It's much easier. So um, that makes great sense. All right. So we, we've talked about what it is, but what makes it super important aside from just the, the basics that you laid out? Yeah. So like, as I mentioned before, the 
um, accessible internet is very key to like the entire idea of what the internet was made for. And I'm sure many of like our listeners like are starting their stores just from you know their laptop and access to the internet. And this has made the internet amazing as like a equalizer for social economic mobility. You know, you can start a business with just a you know a dream and a laptop, and I'm sure they greatly benefit that ability. But those those access you know to that ability is limited by how well you can manipulate you know, our interface tools like mice and keyboards and screens for at least a long time, it was like, you know, if you were blind, you couldn't do anything on the internet. Mm -hmm. Like imagine if, you know, Shopify required the use of a mouse, like you could only, you know, set up a store if you could physically move a mouse to click on things. But then if you have, you know, you're somebody with significant disabilities to where you can't move your arms or can't keep it stable to click on some small buttons, you'd just be totally cut out of this entire option for your life. Uh, so this is, and that's basically what's happening to some of your customers. If your site's not um, accessible enough to the way that they interact with the, the tools. So this is why organizations like the worldwide web consortium have like established web content accessibility guidelines. Like they spent a lot of time building these things out. It's very long documents. Um, a lot of it's like very technical kind of like wishful um, thinking and a lot of it's pretty simple to implement. And then a lot of countries have gone and like directly implemented those standards into the law or like mimicked them. Like the US never likes to, you know, just say, oh, follow this third party standard. So they basically just rewrote the standard into US law without directly referencing it. While the EU just says, use theirs because they're the pros at this. Um, and even like the UN has included web accessibility in their convention for the rights of persons with disabilities. So like, this is a big thing of this open and accessible internet is like really to the point of like a human right, because it's just so much of our uh, networked economy is based on this ability to interact with this stuff that many of us may take for granted how easy it is and how simple uh -huh. this technology has gotten. But there's still many out there that, you know, they can't go to Beyonce's site and buy tickets. Like, such a simple thing that we all can just easily do and we won't even think about. For some of these people, it's like, oh, that's like, that's ruined, ruined their plans, ruined their day. Yeah, okay. just no way to get it done. Yeah, okay. So um, Beyonce is a great example, uh, but what are some other examples of ways that uh, people with a disability would actually need to be able to use you know, a website differently than people who don't have those disabilities? Yeah, there's lots of different ways. Like they call this um, assistive technologies. And I believe there's a, another one that's similar. It just refers to the different software and hardware that those with disabilities might use to you know, interface. Like we use mice and keyboards and vision. Uh, some people, you know, blind or can't move uh, their upper body fully to be able to interact in those same ways. So one example with uh, the blind is like they'll use screen readers that basically read out the content on the screen um, audibly so that they can just listen to it. And these can work in different ways as it you know, can read all the text, it can just read the link titles, it can just read the headings. So as the users, depending on what their need is, they can switch between these as they navigate to you know, get through differently. So they can be like, oh, I, I know I'm trying to get to another page, so let's just do the links. But then if the links are labeled poorly, they might not know which link goes to where they're trying to go. And of course, um, for images, because we can see the images, we know what they're trying to communicate. A screen reader doesn't know what's important about an image, even with you know, modern machine learning getting better. It still doesn't necessarily, it can see maybe, oh, this is a picture of a cat, but it doesn't know what the point of the picture of the cat is. Like, what, why is the cat important? What's the message of it? So uh, they also have these <laughs> really cool things I just learned about recently because I did just get certified in this by the W3C. And apparently there's actually like Braille displays. Like I never thought about it, but it makes a lot of sense. Basically, a little electronic mobilized dots for the Braille. And as it moves down the screen reader, essentially, instead of using audio, it changes on this little pad that has all the Braille on it. So they can just quickly read it in that way. And they even have these for phones. Um, so they can, you know, blind people still need to be able to use their mobile phones like everyone else. 
And uh, there's lots of software actually built into Android and iOS, like in the accessibility options, to where you can actually easily turn that on and then try to, you know, try to get to your site even if you can, and you know, move around just by using simple, you know, up, down, left, right to kind of change through different options that you know those that are good with it can actually do really, really quickly. But when you're first getting started, it's going to be, you know, it's a real struggle. Um, and the iOS one even has an option to turn turn the display off so that you can really feel that like feeling of not being able to see what you're doing. Um, then the next big one, of course, mobility. If you can't, you know, fully move your arms from different, you know, diseases, conditions, injuries that you've taken, uh, you're not gonna be able to use a mouse. And a lot of people in those situations rely on keyboard navigation. So you can go to a website and just hit tab and it'll start moving through the different links. Uh, you know, Specifically, it's moving through like what the internet's focusable elements, you know, links, buttons, anything that's an input of some kind of interactive. Um, but a common issue that happens with this is that stores are not set up to style links that are accessed this way differently. So that you just go to the page and you hit tab and you're selecting something, but you can't tell what it is. Like just looking at it, you're just like, okay, something's selected, but I have no idea where. Um, and that, of course, can be a major, like, just way to lose track of where you even are, because you'll go, like, uh, am I on this link or that link? Maybe the stuff doesn't move in a way that you thought it did, or something that you thought was multiple links is one link, or something that's one link is actually multiple. Uh, and, of course, these can, you know, going back to, you know, the collarbone example, if you break your collarbone, it'll be very nice to be able to go to all your still favorite sites and shop just using the keyboard, instead of being just cut out from all of your favorite you know things to do online um and it's really like speech like we're getting to good uh we're getting to very good vocal recognition mm -hmm. so a lot of people will even interact with their computers and websites by talking they'll just say like oh go to this link or show me all the numbers and i'll tell you which number of what link i want to go to and various kinds of things um and even those that are even more disabled, like they can't even like, you know, <laughs> if you're like Stephen Hawking, you know, you kind of have to have specialized hardware for like very minimal actual physical input, maybe using eye tracking, or they have these like sip puff things that kind of use like, uh -huh. it's almost like a straw in the mouth. You kind of suck in there and blow out. That's your two options. And you, like you can see videos of people using these and they can get around a computer pretty well but it does run into issues when the site's not set up well for that or software's not set up well for that. Uh, yeah, so it's just like using all these very simple things that suddenly make what we consider very easy mouse click can actually be very difficult if things aren't set up properly to accommodate. And with, with that, like, you know, a lot of those things are handled on the, like you said, the software or the application end to help the people, but those things, the, the breakdown after that is whether or not your store, like like we said, images. Are you leveraging the alt tags to provide the information so that if someone can't see the image, the software that they're using can then read the alt tag and tell pers the person what the image is. So that's a simple example. But if your site's not doesn't have the the right usability, it doesn't matter how good their software is. There's there's going to be a breakdown or how good their manipulation is of whatever whatever they're using. So that's that's where we're going. So you're not you're not having to figure out like how every possible person is going to use your site kind of thing, um, or or what specific software they're using or application or phone or or technology or anything. That that's not your responsibility. The, your responsibility is on the the basic usability function, so that all those platforms or softwares or technologies can then take over and leverage your site. Absolutely. Um, okay, so what's the business case for for? I mean, I know it's important, but like, let's let's tie it back to business. Like, I mean, we all want to be good humans and, and help the world and help everybody. But you know, I know I like. I mean, I, I have stores. Like, my I, I'm still thinking the same thing, and I, I'm in this space. But it's like, you know, how does this impact my business? What's the business case for me using web accessibility? Yeah, in a, in a perfect world, just being like, hey just be good to each other would be enough to get everything done. And like Tim Cook 
famously said at a in the, at least famously in the well world of web accessibility said in a shareholders meeting like when we work on our devices accessibility by the blind i don't consider the bloody roi and of course apple's the richest company in the world they can not consider the roi for quite a long time before it really you know comes back to bite them and you know not everybody has that luxury uh, so of course you always got to know the brass tacks how is this going to actually affect um, my business and my users? Of course, it's important. Uh, well, the first, of course, is that if more users have access to your store, you can get some additional sales. And while disabilities may seem quite, um, may seem like there's not a whole lot out there, it may, or at least, you know, you might estimate that this is not going to have a major impact on your bottom line. Uh, the WHO actually estimates that over 13% of the world has mild to severe uh, just vision impairment to where they could benefit from larger text and higher contrast. Um, that's, you know, 13% of the world. And depending on your markets, it can be very different how that is and what their access to, you know, corrective technologies and other aspects would be. Uh, so, but if your store is small, low contrast text, you could be preventing many of those users from completing the purchase. And additionally, you know, in the realm of like how social responsibility and that can affect your you know, your marketing stance, depending on exactly what your company's brand image is, like 90% of websites out there have significant accessibility issues. So even just building a thing where it's like you are the one site in your niche that can handle this audience, uh, that could even give you a position to, you know, specifically market to that audience, be like, hey, our site is accessible, you know, kind of like sub segment your niche of, you know, interest to then also maybe find which ones might be, you know, have some of these disabilities and be like, hey, our site is accessible. Like actually it's a meaningful UVP to this specific subset of your users. I'm not sure exactly how easy it would be to target that specifically, but there could be ways um, to benefit that or just as some uh, members of your audience find that the site's accessible, they share it with their uh, friends because a lot of disabled support groups might share this information to help uh, people find their way through this 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 harsh world, right? And furthermore, Google does reward uh, accessibility. Like that's a big thing in the search engine stuff because they also want to make sure their users, which include those with disabilities, are getting good results. So they will like if they see at least programmatically that you're doing what you can to satisfy accessibility, they'll give you that boost over others because like you can see it in their um the web dev and page speed insights and lighthouse they have an um, seo as well as accessibility scores that will affect your site and how it gets ranked we don't know of course exactly how much that is uh but of course as some as more and more places get better with accessibility they'll probably more harshly punish those that are not doing it so those are you know some big ways that can you know provide a positive benefit to your store. And as you kind of mentioned before, there is a flip side to that, that you know, if you're not putting the appropriate amount of effort into providing an accessible experience, you could be the target of lawsuits. Uh, you know, and we're kind of at the point also where legally we have some pretty clear and understood standards. Like this isn't just a like, oh, what does accessibility even mean? How do we say if a store is accessible or not? Like those standards have been made uh, they have been like written and codified for many years now, even. So like there is kind of a point where you, you need to start meeting there as you get bigger and bigger. Um, like as an example, not really like, a gray area up, anymore. Yeah. Like as I brought up earlier, Beyonce, uh, Beyonce.com did get sued for not being accessible. Kylie Cosmetics as well. Uh, we don't know like what the results were because all these are settled out of court. Um, but probably very costly to them and mm -hmm. probably making it a lot better now. And just in the first half of uh, 2019, there are over 5,000 uh, lawsuits just related to the web accessibility part of the ADA. So like that's just that one specific law in the US, not counting many other laws that may affect in different ways and affect companies differently. And of course, across the world, like every major country that has any you know, significant technological advancement has laws about this. So we may focus on the American ones. If you're in the EU or UK, you have 
your own ones and they are there. They're not <laughs> like, this isn't just an American thing. So if you're getting up to that point, you do need to start like possibly looking into this. Like if you're uh, well into seven figures, uh, definitely make sure this is something that's getting looked at. Uh, potentially, I mean, there are specialized firms that can help you build policies to make sure that when you're interacting with vendors and developers that everybody knows the standard that you're aiming for. Uh, but if you are smaller, like don't stress too much about this, but maybe just keep it in mind uh, for the future when you start to grow that you can start to put a bit more effort into this or when you are looking at hiring a developer, ask them about this as opposed to, you know, not bringing it up and then finding out many years later, they've just not been doing it. Yeah. And from a, from the, the legal side of it, like, you know, we, again, we're not lawyers or anything like that, but what the lawyers that we've talked to who are, have represented firm or represented stores and stuff in these kind of lawsuits, um, it's literally, they're looking for the, the easy marks. Okay. They're out there looking at stores that like have done nothing because then it's a shoe in. They, they, now, if you've, if you've made your best effort and you've done your what you can for accessibility and it's clear that you've done that, you're, about, you're more of a fight than they want, okay? Because you actually, you can say, look, I've, here's what, what we've done. They're looking for the stores, which a lot of them, including big ones, have done nothing. So in, like Eric was saying, there's, there's some pretty clearly defined things that you're supposed to do in order to provide access. If you haven't done those, it's, it's, it's an open and shut case for them. So that's what they go after. And there's plenty of stores out there that have never done that. So that's what they're looking for when they round up these stores. And they don't usually target one store. They, they target hundreds at a time or 50 or 60 or whatever, because they, they go through and they just basically get little settlements out of every single one of them. Sometimes they're bigger settlements, sometimes they're little, but they can say, hey, look, here's the, they give you a, a document basically that where they had one of their experts go through and, and list out all the accessibility violations or lack thereof on your store. And you get this thing and the, the judge is basically like, okay, well, here's the standards. Here's your violations. You, you owe them, right? So that basically you try to settle it out of court, but the stores that actually, you know, take the steps they get bypassed because again, they're out for the easy prey. These, these guys are not, this is not like a legitimate type lawsuit. This is just a, a, a money-making scheme that they're, they're running that unfortunately takes advantage of some of the disability acts and, and things like that. So from the legal side of it, do, if you put your best foot forward, you actually you know, do what Eric's talking about here and use the web accessibility standards and put, and put those into place in your site, you're going to be way better prepared in case something ever does happen because you can actually say, Hey, you know, in good faith, we've done everything we possibly could. And then, um, most of the time they'll just leave you alone. And there, there's apps out there, um, and services that you can pay that, um, will help with that. So if you want to add an extra layer of, of your web accessibility and stuff like that, you could do that. And I'm sure Eric will talk about a little bit about that in a second. So Eric, I guess to give it back to you, what do store owners actually do what can they do to improve their web accessibility? Yeah, so there actually are quite a few uh, like things that are pretty small and simple to do that make up a significant portion of you know what is expected of a store. Because as you mentioned, like the standards are like pretty strict and codified, but there is quite a bit of uh, we'll say wiggle room in terms of like what's an appropriate. Um, an amount for like you know a small store that can't dedicate a lot of resources to this what's an appropriate amount for them versus you know an apple or something that should be able to you know get it done because they have all the resources in the world to do it uh, but so, but small things actually cover the bulk of this so one of the you know i kind of hinted at this a bit earlier is having your like buttons and links be very clear about what they do you know like you might have a lot of context uh, to a link, you know, do you have images and other texts that kind of say stuff like, oh, it's uh, Father's Day is coming up. So, you know, we got a bunch of great new products for you. And then you have a link that says view. Now, someone that can see this that close visual relationship between these and read them will understand that that probably means view the Father's Day products. But if somebody is moving through the links, trying to find something specific uh, and they get to a link and the screen reader just tells them view, they have no idea where that's going. 
And we do talk about this a bit in, you know, more conventional RO stuff of, you know, the, the fear of clicking something when you don't know what it's going to do. And that become compounded when you don't have all this extra context around it. And that ends up, you know, going back to you know, like the curb cuts thing that does benefit others too. Like anybody um, that may have been a bit unclear about what exactly they were viewing. If you say view Father's Day collection, now they know as well. Like, so the screen reader makes it much easier. Now, just looking at the links, they know view Father's Day, but also anybody else looking at it that may not have caught the relationship. Maybe you have a little bit too much white space between them on that person's specific device. And now they're not sure, is this related to that or not? But when you make the buttons clear, it becomes very easy for everybody to understand where the link goes. So like when you're choosing how to name your links and buttons and anything that's interactive, just saying like exactly what it does is going to go a long ways. Uh, there are, you know, if you have a developer, there are ways to code in kind of like an alternative label for screen readers to see. Um, but that does take a, you know, a bit more know-how of what exactly you're working with. But so if you just make the main visible text, something that's clearly understood, that will solve most of that problem. Um, also like that works with speech. If people are communicating with their computer by speech and not through a mouse, they can just say, you know, click the button that says view Father's Day collection. They don't need to say, uh, click the button that says view. And then the computer goes, yeah, but like which one? They don't need to have that extra step. It just makes it much more seamless. So, um, and we did mention before adding alt text to images. Um, like you need to make sure that anytime like your theme or anything else allows you to add alt text, you should be doing it. Um, if you, I mean, if you don't have an option, there's not too much you can do uh, without a developer to make sure that they, unless you know how to go in and do that yourself. Uh, but at least if they're giving you the option, make sure that you're putting in a clear alt text. And this is meant to be, as I mentioned before, an alternative to the meaning of the image. Like what is the person actually supposed to get from it? Not a description, like not just a full description of what is in the image, focus on just the part that actually matters to somebody that was looking at it. Like if you sell uh, stuff for, you sell products for older individuals like health and fitness, and you have like a, image of an older gentleman playing catch, like throwing a baseball to a, uh, you know, a young kid, you don't need to describe like, oh, that they're in the park and what color clothes they have. Like this isn't an audio description or a text description of the image. It's just, you know, say, oh, it's a grandfather throwing a baseball to his grandson. And then they can kind of get enough context from that without needing all that extra information. So like, that's how you're supposed to properly use an alt tag. Uh, some people try to say like, you should just cram a bunch of SEO stuff into those. Uh, I mean, that might work for a while. I'm sure Google's gonna get wise to that trick. Um, I mean, of course, if you can work them in and have it be relevant to what the image is, go for it, but don't just try to, you know, shoehorn in extra keywords just because you think, you know, you're gonna get rewarded for that. Um, and lastly, one of the other major things is to make it so that focused elements, when they're you know, navigated to by keyboard, that they actually just have a clear, uh, one of the easiest ways is just throw an outline on it. Like uh, in the style sheet, there's what they call a pseudo selector. And this one's called focus visible. And you, like, you can look this up, how to do this, but you can just say, hey, anything when it's focused visible, give it a black outline. And now immediately anybody that comes to the site can easily just tab through and see exactly where they are. Of course, uh, a developer and designer could probably go through and make sure that the styles that you're giving are a bit more, you know, stylish and brand appropriate uh, and different elements. But this is a quick, easy way um, just to get that done. Like if you're just trying to, you know, you can't put a bunch of resources to it. You don't have a developer. Just putting a, you know, focus visible outline, black and you'll be good to go on that. Uh, um, yeah, guys, it sounds more complicated than it is. It's really a, a pretty simple, simple fix when you get that, when you get into it, it's just, you know, it's CSS, it's a little bit of a, you know, a code thing, but it's not, it's not scary. And it's honestly something you could, if you don't want to touch it yourself, it could be done for probably 
25 or 30 bucks from a developer. I mean, they would not, it wouldn't take them long to do it at all. Even 25 cents. Like it's like, <laughs> I know, it's, uh, done. it's done. I know. I just don't know any developer that would be like, yeah, I'll just do it for a dollar. You know, they'll probably charge you at least 20. Yeah, like, oh, that's going to take five hours. <laughs> no way to do it faster. Totally. All right. So obviously we, we covered a lot. It's, it's a little bit of scarier stuff here. And like, kind of like, oh man, I didn't, and probably people have probably never even considered this aspect of it. I, mean, I know for a long time, we didn't either in, until it kind of started getting you know, in our face and we learn more and more, but where can people go to learn more about this, get better educated and kind of get up to speed on what they need to know? Uh, yeah, some easy like keywords to search for are, you know, you can just go to Google uh, W3C space WAI. That's the Web Accessibility Initiative. They have, um, I mean, if you want to read the actual full on standards, you can, you know, knock yourself out doing that. But they also have a lot of quick, easy guides that are like, hey, this is, you know, what web accessibility is. This is the key things. And you can, you know, see some videos of people trying to get through websites with different assistive technology. And you'll see like, oh, this is like not, a, you know, a small difference. This is very critical to a lot of these people's lives. Um, so that's easy. W3C space, WAI, that'll get you plenty of that. And they have, uh, they even have um, uh, kind of like code checkers where you can put in your website and it'll go and identify what major issues may be, mm -hmm. as well as if you've been doing uh, speed tests on your store, you may have from Lighthouse or PageSpeed Insights, they'll have a section on that too. These can't necessarily, you know, they can check if your images have alt tags, but they can't know whether or not your alt tags are appropriate for the image. Um, so they can only get you so far, but they will kind of maybe give you an idea of where you stand. Yeah. And yeah, the, the fact that you can just submit your site and have them kind of look at your code and give you an idea, it, it, it'll start clicking real quick once you start looking at that kind of stuff. It'll, it'll make a lot more sense. And then you can also look for, um, there's other services and apps out there. Almost all the different platforms have some sort of um, usability type widget that you could put on your site. Um, we use a couple different ones. Um, so look, I don't want to re re uh, recommend one specifically because of course, you know, this is kind of, we're kind of getting into the legal realm and uh, we're not lawyers, never played one on TV, but you know, I did stay at a holiday Inn kind of thing. Um, so there's, there's a, there are some of those out there. Um, you can put those on your site to give you an, yet an extra layer of assistance for you know people with disabilities and then also an extra layer of protection and um, it's kind of a standard operating procedure for how we work on stores now it's one of the first things we do because it's 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 becoming more and more important i mean it's always been important i'm not trying to discount the disability stuff but it's really becoming a priority the more and more of the world we get online absolutely it, like, it can be very critical for this subset of the population just to be able to participate in many of these things that we take for granted. And while this has always kind of existed in the physical space, the electronic world's a lot more of where, especially with, you know, quarantines and everything, it's a lot more of where, you know, we live. Yep. Absolutely. Well, guys, so you've got some reading ahead of you um, on usability standards and stuff like that. Don't freak out. Just realize that there's some simple stuff you can do to really protect yourself and deliver a better experience to all the different types of users that want to come to your site. And then you might be opening up a, you know, a whole new sub-segment of your audience that you weren't unable to serve before and now you know, can become an awesome, awesome customer segment for you. So do a good deed and also get rewarded for it. it would never be a bad thing, right? So right now, guys, what I need you to do is I need you to go and make sure you are subscribed to the podcast. If it's on, if you're on YouTube, subscribe there. If you're on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify or whatever, whatever platform you listen to it, make sure you are subscribed. And if you'd like to show notes or you need links to the different platforms, go to buildgrowscale.com forward slash podcast. You can access everything there, all the show notes, for, especially from this one where we talked a lot about a lot of technical topics. It'll all be outlined there. Uh, make it real easy for you to get and get you, get you rocking. And again, the last final thing is if you enjoy this podcast, which again, we do for you, leave us a review, leave us a comment, let us know what you think. And if you have ideas for episodes or guests you'd like us to feature, 
drop that in there too. Because again, this podcast is for you and we enjoy doing it, but we'd love to have your ideas so we can make it better for you. With that, thank you, Eric. And we will see you guys on the next episode. 